And we'll look at what, what's happening in the art market at the moment. There's an absolute rush for art fairs. I don't know if any of you have been to an art fair. Have you been to an art fair? Anyone? Do you think yeah. it which one, which one do you go to? Arco, yeah. Now, Arco, I went this year, actually. Arco this year was not a great success, I have to say. No, it was, not, it was very disappointing. Not very many interesting works, low prices, not many sales, and much smaller, too, wasn't it? It was about a whole aircraft carrier smaller. So what's happening is basically that the art fairs are contracting. You now have basically three major fairs in Basel, Basel, Miami, and Hong Kong, which has been taken over by Basel. Art Basel, um, and they basically are dominating all the buyers and all the sellers, and that seems to be the way the, the fair world is going. Dealers are fighting the auction world by through the art fair, basically. Art Basel this year sold 1.8 billion dollars worth of work. Yeah, you know, 1.8 billion. They sold one Andy Warhol. I think I may have it actually. 150 Marilyns for 80 million dollars. So. Yeah, on, on the day as well. So, you know, you're looking at auction-type activity now in the, in the art fairs. Um, this is an example of Hong Kong art, and this is going to grow and grow and grow. At the moment, there are a growing number of U.S. dealers and um, rest of the world dealers um, appearing in, in both Hong Kongs in 2008, 2009. So, um, that's, the, that's the art fair market. That does a lot for dealers. It creates very, very heavy selling environment. They'll sell more in an art fair than they will all year. The auction does the same. It basically compacts all, this, all the activity into, into four or five hours. So you get a number of things going on. You get, as I say, trans tr price transparency. You're able to refer back to past prices. And there are a couple of indexes now which will give you all the auction house prices um, historically. Um, it stops you making sales with people not knowing what the price was arbitrage, prevents arbitrage, it creates publicity, and crucially, it creates a buying frenzy. People become obsessed in auctions. They get hot, they get excited, and they become very, very free with their money. So it does actually create, in many ways, an artificial price, a price you wouldn't necessarily pay if you were buying from a dealer. Yeah. So this is why people sell at auction, because you get the highest price, and they tend to buy elsewhere, because you know, it's, it's a hidden price. So you, you arrive at an auction with 15 pictures, nobody knows what you bought them for really, and, and you sell them hopefully in a frenzy. And that's a, basically how these extraordinary rewards you can receive in a very, very short period of time. It's a very inefficient market, and that's good for all of us in the market, as long as we don't lose out. Okay, I'm going to move on now to this slide, which is more interesting. It's actually showing you in an, another graphic slide, and this, is, this has taken my computer skills to their limit, you have the art schools at the bottom, you have the price, the reputation, the blue one, and then you have the, the fact that you can actually fail at this very early stage, and even fail at the alpha stage. Um, once you have a show in um, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, in New York, or the Tate, or somewhere like that, or a documenter in, in, in um, Kassel, or the Venice Marine, the Venice Biennale, you're probably completely safe. There was an artist, if, if you know the artist who's going to be in Venice from a particular country, and you know in advance of Venice, then you should buy then, because after Venice, the price will go up by about five or six times. So it, this is pretty much secure once you're at this level. Um, the only person who's managed to avoid this whole system is Hurst, Damien Hurst. He's managed to avoid the system of dealer, dealer, auction. Um, he's gone straight to auction. I'll show you in an, an example of that in a minute. And here he is, here's Damien Hurst. This is the great sale in 2008, just before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Literally the day before Lehman Brothers collapsed, he sold um, 100, it was actually about a, nearly $200 million worth of art in two, three days. Uh, this piece, he doesn't look very happy, but this piece here sold for 16 million, the golden calf. Um, but from 2000, this is a warning, from this sale in 2008, to 2010, end of 2010, the unit value of Hearst fell from 831,000 at the peak to 136,000. So even Damien Hearst, without the validation, without the museum supporting him, his price is very volatile. Very, very volatile. So even Hearst, well even, he's particularly volatile actually. People can't sell Hearst anymore, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. apart from the butterfly pictures. So this is what's happened to the Hearst market. This was the peak in 2008 at the time of the sale, and now 
and it hasn't gone up more, much from the middle of 2010. Actually, it stayed about the same. Um, and this is where it all comes in. This is where the politics comes in. Um, basically, there's one dealer called Gagosian I mentioned before, who's been maintaining the value of the Hearst market by buying the work back at auction, essentially, if he has to. Uh, and then there are a few collectors. Mugrabi is the biggest. He has 110 pieces, I think, in his collection. Now, he doesn't want this to lose value, does he? He doesn't want it to go down by a factor of eight. Um, and so what, ta what Hearst is doing is he's making a catalog of his work to, make it, to give it some sort of value. And he's looking for a retrospective exhibition in 2012 at the Olympic, at the London Olympics, which is going to be terrible, um, at the Tate. So he's trying desperately to give himself critical um, ammunition. Now, it's very dangerous here. I put down here, Mugrabi family are waiting for a discount to market. Now, all you financial wizards, which I'm sure there are many in the, in the audience today, will know what discount to market means. It means you wait for the lowest possible price and then you buy. But I think, purse now, you're actually buying, you're not buying discount to market. You're buying something which will never recover. Um, you're buying the equivalent of um, Enron, essentially. <laughs> um, so, um, Enron. Enron's finished, isn't it? There's no value in Enron shares. So um, there'll be, I don't, I, this is personal view. I mean, I, I'm, people may disagree with me. I'm sure many people will. I think there's very little value in that at all now. But that's just my view. I mean, these, these are works. Look, I mean, they're worth, this one was sold for 16 and a half million. I mean, these are not small value pieces. But if you were still investing, this would give you hope. This man here, Gagosian, um, he represents the estates of 77 artists. Um, up one billion annual, so I'm talking about people like Rothko, I mean really major estates he represents. He controls Ed Rushka, amazingly expensive artist, Richard Prince, the photographer, Takashi Murakami, the, 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 the pop artist from Japan, Jeff Koons, you've heard of these people? You know, all the really big names, he controls all their markets, all their work, and he has very close links to the Tate, the Guggenheim, MoMA, and these are his collectors. Steve Cohen is the um, multi-billion dollar um, hedge fund um, buyer. Uh, Magraba, we mentioned before. Francois Pinot, who was who's the head of um, Funny Auction House. Um, I can't remember the name. Something with a C and an H. Um, and Ellie Broad, who's um, head of the LA Museum of Modern, Modern Art, a donor. So this is his world. Now, this world keeps the price of all these people going. So when he dies again, it's about death again, but when he dies, who's going to continue this? So it is slightly interesting at the moment. And here's an example of an artist. So this is an artist who was represented um, by Gagosian. Her price is in 2000, Cecily Brown, she's a good painter. Her uh, prices in 2000 uh, were $8,000, okay? I don't, think she, I, don't, I don't know which dealer she was with, a very small um, dealer, primary dealer. And then Gagosian took over. And now, in 2011, she's worth on average 800000 So that's an increase a year on year. I can't even do the percentage, but it's a considerable increase. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happens when Gagosian takes the artist. He, he really does show the work around gets them into major collections, gets them into the big museum shows. And that translates into dollars. Okay, and, th and then he will probably sell a work at Sotheby's, of course, not the other one. Sell it at Sotheby's, and then he'll get a transparent price. So then you go to his gallery, you say, I want to buy a Cecily Brown. He'll say, well, look, it's selling for about 900,000. I can't sell it for less, Eight, maybe 850. And that's how you create this. It's true, it's that it does. Yeah, that's how you create prices in the art world. I mean, how it is. Yeah. Okay. Another example, Richard Prince, I mentioned, very famous American photographer. In 2004, Prince's dealers were getting 70,000 for this sort of image here, the nurse series. Um, by 2007, under Gagosian, Overseas Nurse 2002, which is the same series, made 8.4 million. I mean, I mean, that's just silly. That is, I mean, it's extraordinary. That was the peak of the market for Richard Prince. Um, uh, you know, 2008, his market crashed along with a lot of others. Um, at Sotheby's New York, subject to uh, since the wild fluctuations, you see he's now fluctuating between about 1.5 and 6.5, huge fluctuations. So, uh, you know, uh, buyer beware, that's all I can say. Um, <laughs> it's quite a sinister image, isn't it? I mean, wayward nurse, obviously just cut up a patient, I think, or something. 
Um, okay, so that's the basic of how, anyway, that's basically value in the contemporary art market. Now the new markets are slightly different, but not dramatically. Um, these are all the art fairs, which, which are the major ones going on at the moment. The international ones, I said, Art Basel, Art Hong Kong, Fries, Mainz, and Berlin. And Art Hong Kong is the new arrival. So Hong Kong is now the second largest, by some estimates, the largest market in the world now. I mean, it is extraordinary. It's larger. I think the contemporary market now is larger than New York. So you are looking at tomorrow, really. We look at China. I mean, it is, it is tomorrow. Um, there are lots of other fairs. There are the regional fairs, and then there are the national fairs. Um, and if you want to be a gallery and start exhibiting, you can pay, you know, 40,000. You can pay 200,000 for a big booth in Miami. You know, it depends. It's a very expensive business. So dealers have to sell. I mean, that's why there's a lot of hard selling going on at the international fairs. I think it um, this is an example of Basel this year, and just show you the breakdown very quickly, dominated by US dealers and German dealers, uh, essentially, with a few UK, UK and France. It hasn't really recognized the rise of Asia. So I still think that there is a, uh, a disconnection between value, the real value of Asian art, and the market valuation of Asian art. In other words, judging by its representation at the major money-making fairs, it's underrepresent hugely underrepresented. So that suggests to me that the price is, as I say, um, much lower than it should be, and it's got a long, long, long way to go. You see, emerging markets is down here. It's a tiny little section um, of the total fare. Um, and if you look at Hong Kong, the international art fair in Hong Kong, of course, emerging markets uh, is much larger. So is the representation from um, East Asia and China. So. This could be a model of the market of tomorrow in terms of proportional representation. Um, China. Um